so, uh, please welcome our panel today. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Iman Kachani, who's an obstetrician at the Maternity Hospital in Les Orangiers in Rabat. Uh, Marlene Temmerman, immediately on my left, former director of HRP at WHO, but now is in Nairobi as head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Aga Khan University. And finally, Noza Sh Sharaya, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist in Mumbai and has been uh, the former Secretary General of FIGO in India. We're here to talk about the elephant in the room except it's no longer the elephant, it's here, right in front of us, the subject of abortion. We've got one hour to talk about this issue. To begin with, before we get into the complexities, the passion, sometimes even the anger around abortion, I want to invite our three panellists to tell us their stories about how they got here onto this panel why they are concerned about the issue of abortion and what part it plays in their professional lives. So I'm going to start off here with Marlene and just go down uh, the panel that way. Marlene, abortion, tell us your story. Yes, uh, thanks Richard. Good afternoon to all of you. My story started in the uh, early 80s. I was a young gynecologist working in the Netherlands in Belgium uh, abortion was illegal at that time, but we had women who were admitted at the hospital with com complications of unsafe abortion. One young girl even died. And then at the hospital in Brussels, we decided, now it's enough, we are going to do abortion, even if it is illegal. We got the agreement from the hospital management, and as a department of OBGYN, we provided services uh, and women came because we knew by working in the field that those women who have uh, you know the higher class or those who are well connected they found their way the abortion was done even in catholic hospitals but the poor vulnerable women they had nowhere to go so they, they were looking everywhere and they ended up very often in unsafe abortion because I think we all know that a woman who really who is pregnant and she cannot keep, she cannot accept the pregnancy for one reason or another, she is not asking herself what does the law in my country says? Is it legal or illegal? I mean she will she is desperate, she will look for a solution, be it clandestine, be it in safe conditions. So at that time of course um, it was difficult because it was illegal. And when we tried to inform, to involve the partners, we asked them to sign if there was a partner. But of course that has no legal value. So we were very often confronted with police. We, all of us uh, were prosecuted. We had to go stand trial several times. And I remember very well, well one trial in 85 was about a girl of um, 14 years old. She was a little bit, well, she was a bit mentally retarded. She was pregnant, it was late diagnosis. And we did a prostaglandin abortion um, uh, requested by her, by the family and so on. And then uh, a complaint was filed in court and the prosecutor in 85 in Belgium said there was no reason at all to justify an abortion on a 14-year-old girl because, number one, in Africa, even in some states in, in, the, in the US, women of 14, they become mothers. So why not in Belgium? Secondly, they are doing better and better. They are in good conditions, they do sports, they win all kind of go-to. So why can they not carry a pregnancy? And number three was that the Holy Virgin Maria was also 14 when she gave birth to her son Jesus. Mm. So that was 85, 30 years ago. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Marlene. Emma? I have two stories, not one. Um, one is that of a woman, and the other one is that of a man. Because when we talk about abortion, we often talk about, we always talk about women, but men are also affected, directly or indirectly. The first one is um, a 22, 23 years old woman 
who uh, had had an abortion in a private clinic. Uh, now, the country where I work, Morocco, the law criminalizes abortion unless it is to save a mother's life. And obviously, there was nothing about saving a mother's life in the case of this patient when it came to breathing and heart beating, but it was about saving her social life because she was unmarried and she couldn't have that baby. Um, she went to a private clinic. She never saw the face of the doctor or the nurse. She doesn't even know who gave her the procedure. She woke up in a dark room and it was done. But then she came to us, a public hospital, a few days after that, with heavy pelvic pain, fever, and some bleeding. And long story short, we discovered a massive, massive abscess, pelvic abscess, as a consequence of a procedure we didn't know much about, but that was definitely carried out in um, conditions that didn't meet the, the, um, the required norms. And so she became part of the estimated 7 million, pe 7 million women admitted in a hospital to um, um, address complications from unsafe abortions. Uh, we did what we had to do, and what could have been a very easy, simple, and short procedure turned into a huge, heavy surgery with, most importantly, lifelong complications for her because uh, her fertility and her reproductive function were heavily um, affected by that. And when we talk about unsafe abortion or illegal abortion, we very often see the numbers of mortality, but there's very little research on the morbidities and the lifelong complications these women are left with. This is for the first story. The second one, which is uh, the one where I'm going to talk about this man, is a couple in their mid-40s, uh, who um, came to our hospital because um, the, the wife had started having irregular menstruations. She was in premenopause, and like many women her age, she thought, okay, I can stop taking my contraception, nothing will happen. So she removed her IUD, and what had to happen happened. A few months later, she was pregnant. They accepted it, uh, and they decided to carry on with the pregnancy, but because of her age, she had to go through the mandatory morphologic sonography at 24 weeks, where we discovered major fetal impairments for the fetus. And so not only uh, did she find herself with a pregnancy she didn't want, she also found herself with you know, a, a fetal prognosis that was very reserved. We didn't know what kind of impairments these impairments was, were and what implications was that going to have on the life of this fetus. But obviously, legally speaking, we could not terminate this pregnancy. And I'm bringing up her husband to the discussion because we had in front of us this couple with a terrible despair and distress in their eyes. And there was absolutely nothing we could do about that. And while leaving the clinic, the husband told me something that I found quite strong. He said, uh, I'm a conservative person, and had you told me a few years ago, what do you think about abortion, I would have said, no, it's a no-go, it's killing babies. But now that it's affecting me, we really need to do something about it. And I, I, I really wanted to share that story with you, not only because it's involving, you know, uh, the... the, the the man in the, the discussion on unsafe abortion, but also because it's very easy to talk about abortion. Everybody, everybody has an opinion on abortion, but very few people know what it is exactly. Very few people put faces and names on the issue of unsafe abortion, and very few people can really feel what's the distress and the despair of these people when they cannot access, access safe abortion services. Absolutely. Thank you very much. No, sir. Richard, my story is a little easier <laughs> compared to what Imain does in a country where abortion is illegal and Marlene who worked in a country where it was illegal and became legal. I came into obstetrics and gynecology 15 years after India had legalized abortion. So my previous generation had done all the hard work. Fortunately for us in India, abortions are something that gynecologists do. You don't think about it. If you practice obstetrics and gynecology and look after women, you look after them for their abortions. About 14 years later, I 
became what you might call a reluctant advocate. The Federation of OBGYN Societies of India is a big federation. We now have 32,000 members and it has 27 committees. And uh, my mentor, who was present at that time, asked me to take charge of the committee for safe abortion. We call it the MTP committee. And my initial reaction was no. Mm -hmm. There are much more interesting committees when you're an obstetrician. I wanted to do food and medical drugs and equipment committee. And she said, no, this is the committee you take. And for me, that was a time in my life that completely changed everything. When I started working with that committee and traveling in India, I realized that for a woman, giving her the access and the choice of having a safe abortion is probably the most difficult it's the most important thing that we as healthcare providers can do. They have been denied and when they are denied, women who cannot have abortion with respect and dignity go ahead and do it anyway, which is why India, with an act which legalized abortion in 1971, still has abortion as the third most important cause of maternal mortality. We have a large number of unsafe abortions even today. One thing led to another and we managed to completely bring the Federation in close contact with the government. We amended the law twice, making abortion simpler and more accessible. We wrote the comp comprehensive abortion care guidelines. We came up with a charter of rights for patients. And then one thing led to another. I served on the board of IPAS. I served, I now serve on the board of Guttmacher and this is my fourth women deliver, which is why I think I have <laughs> probably been invited to be on the stage and talk about something I feel so strongly about. I believe that this is something women should be allowed to decide themselves without any restrictions or interference. And I also believe that every healthcare I believe every healthcare provider has to be both pro life and for me it's only the woman's life that matters and her choice and pro choice. I mean there is no question because she's at the center of the equation. And whenever we bring other things in, I believe that's conflict. When you look after someone, there can't be a conflict of interest. And if she is the one I'm looking after, she is the most important person in my life. Okay, Rosa, thank you very much indeed. Now, before we get on to talking about um, some of the issues of abortion itself, I want to talk about preventing abortion because the Guttmacher Institute published a report this week looking at uh, adolescent girls and showing that if you met the unmet need for contraception amongst adolescent girls, one of their arguments was that you could prevent avert um, 3.2 million abortions. But if you look at the uh, evidence from Family Planning 2020, and many of you in this room may have been in London when FP 2020 was launched, it was a fantastic event. Um, uh, there was this enormous um, groundswell of support for a new revolution in meeting the unmet need additional 120 million women uh, and girls in 69 nations were supposed to have been um, fulfilling that unmet need. But if you go to the data, we're way off target, absolutely way off target. Um, at best, according to the last three years of data on the FP2020 website, we're going to get to 70 million, a long way away from 120 million. So what I want to know from the three of you is what's gone wrong? What's gone wrong with that effort, that fantastic idea of of revivifying um, a campaign for access to contraception. Who'd like to start that? Yeah, Marie? family planning, uh, Richard, I think you said it very well, and it has also been shown by another Lancet publication from the uh, disease control from the World Bank that the most, the best investment one can make in women's health is investing in family planning. It is a low investment with a high return, and by doing so, if we would meet the goals that were set in, FEM, in FP 2020, we could really prevent 28 million uh, unwanted pregnancies, so many uh, 1.5 deaths prevented. So all the evidence is there, the models are there. Why don't we do it? Or not, not at the pace, uh, that, that pace that we would like to. I think it, there are many reasons, cultural, religions, morality, don't forget that in 1994, 179 countries in ICPD program of action have signed, have committed to uh, lowering unsafe abortion. And of course, prevention is number one. 
But I think for me, the, the most important reason is lack of leadership. Right. And the, the, with the MDGs, the world has called for those who are in the area MNH, MNCH. But it has been a struggle, and it's still a struggle, to get the R from reproductive health, which is mainly family planning, access to safe abortion, to have the, the R at, at equ equally at, uh, on the agenda. We know that some donors, and of course it's a, a privilege to choose, but they go for the mother and the child. It's easier to find funding for pregnant women and children than for everything that is related to sex. Family planning, abortion, uh, sexually transmitted diseases. It's kind of looked at it differently. So I hope that now with the SDGs that there will be leaders, presidents, first ladies, uh, advocates who will do the same efforts for the R, for the family planning, mm. than what has been done so far and what has to continue, of course, for the pregnant woman and the children. And in Morocco, how does that play out? I think that um, one of the reasons why we're falling short of, you know, uh, meeting the unmet need for contraception is because the statistics that we have are official statistics and the official statistics are for official people. Official people are the married people, official people are the documented people, official people are not the adolescent unmarried girl. Official people are not the migrant undocumented worker going through Morocco trying to cross over to Europe and most frequently never succeeding. So we are, we must recognize that we are failing to address these groups. They are non-existent. They do not appear in any policy, in any program. They have very specific and different needs, yet they're still all put together in the same, you know, vulnerable group bubble. When this bubble is taken into account, which is very often not the case, and this is where the missed need is, and this is where we're heavily and badly failing, I think. No, sir, in India? Yeah, basically an observation, and then I have a problem with the question you just asked. My observation is that the world knows that you have to invest in contraception, and it's not expensive to do so if you wanted to reach every woman with a modern contraceptive. I think Gutmarka, in its uh, adding it up in 2014, said uh, 9.4 billion dollars to give modern contraception to each and every woman in the world. The shortfall is 5.3 and I just did a rough calculation. 5,000 of us came here in 15 jets. For the cost of 15 jets we came in, every woman in the world could have a modern contraception, right. but she's not getting it. Right. Now, my, my problem is, why do we start talking about abortion by first talking about contraception? Right. <laughs> Abortion, abortion starts when contraception has already failed or there has been a choice or whatever and the woman is pregnant. And I find that, I'm sorry to say we are almost apologetic and being correct by talking about contraception when we start talking about abortion. Of course I'm a clinician, I'm a caregiver, I know contraception is important and I would advise it to each and every woman who comes to me. But still, 56 million abortions annually, according to the latest good marker figures. Mm. This is something that's extremely common. It's the second commonest thing we deal with after childbirth. And there's all this attention on childbirth and delivery, which I'm very happy about, but none of it on abortion. Yeah. In my country, 27 million births and maybe 11 or 12 million abortions, and yet we prefer to look the other way. So my issue here is when we talk about abortion, Let's talk about abortion. Let's talk about women accessing abortion. Because when you talk about contraception, when, when we talk about contraception, it's almost as if, in, in, in a way, a woman is almost being stigmatized. Did, was she careless? Didn't she know she had to use contraception? How could she have not used contraception? And then my bigger concern is tagging. Again, I'm all for counseling for contraception after abortion. But tagging contraception to abortion makes it coercive in many parts of the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I know that in my country, in the public sector, and we've looked at figures, there are some states which have outrageous 80 and 90 percent incidence of sterilization after abortions are done. This woman has a gun to her head. She's told, you will get an abortion if you accept contraception. So, extremely important to deal with both, extremely important to prevent pregnancy. After all, the safest abortion is the one that isn't done. But when we talk about abortion, Let's talk about abortion. So, let's talk about abortion. So yes. Yeah, okay, Marlene, go on. Yes, but I fully agree, but let, let's not disconnect, because there are other countries, like, look at China. You can go for an abortion, but then you don't get the contraception care after an abortion. So, we have about 10 million abortions every year. 30% of them are second abortions, and 30% are third abortions. So there is a, a huge repeat abortion because there is a disconnect between an abortion and contraception. And those countries in the world who are the best are the ones who are really investing in family planning and contraception and abortion followed, to, I mean, to put it together, not, let's not dissociate. Yeah. Or it's a woman's choice. Sure. I, I work with an IPPF affiliate in my country and they're always showing us figures of maybe a 30% IUD uptake, 20% permanent methods. They have excellent counseling, but the other women go back with either condoms or pills. And sometimes I tell them, you know what she's telling you? She's telling you, I'll go home and think about it. Yeah. She's got good count, count counseling, so we cannot judge her and decide that we can force preventing the next pregnancy by, by so it, it, it has to be done with good quality. So let's talk, let's talk directly about abortion. You've already cited the 56 million Guttmacher figure, which was published last week. Um, in other work that's come out of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, looking at maternal mortality, um, they found that abortion was the second biggest cause of maternal death, one in seven maternal deaths caused by, um, through abortion. Um, so why do we prefer? In the global health, I'm not even talking about policy makers here, um, not in the global health community. But why does the global health community prefer to look the other way? I mean, even our own family, so to speak, doesn't want to address the subject of abortion. Why? Yeah, well, I have a very uh, quick comment on that, and um, it goes back to what Nozer, you were saying earlier. Why? Because when we talk about abortion, we don't talk about A, B, O, R, T, I, O, N. We talk about preventing unsafe abortion. We talk about providing post-abortion, post-unsafe abortion care. But we don't use the words we need to use. We never talk about abortion directly as a choice, as a right, and as a service that has to be available for every woman and every girl, no matter what the reasons are, what you know the history behind it is, and what the consequences may be in more conservative societies. So. Uh, it, it really hurts, especially for people who see maternal mortality behind them every day, to see that we're not talking about some sort of weird virus we've just discovered and we don't know how to treat it. We're talking about a very easy procedure. We're talking about something that can take 10 minutes and then it's done safely in a clean environment, respecting the norms with no, you know, no consequences for nobody. Um, and, and by making things complicated, by stigmatizing the use of the word abortion, let's talk about abortion, let's not be afraid of addressing this need and this right, I think is one of the reasons why we're still failing to uh, you know, address this important cause of maternal mortality. No, so, uh, you know, we've always known that the one most immediately and easily preventable cause of maternal mortality is safe abortion. Mm. We've always known that. Mm. And yet you have documents and targets, we would have done our MDGs better and you cannot have a 70 per 100,000 figure in the SDGs unless you take this up front mm. without any embarrassment. And this is something I think we need to take up with world leaders, with donors, and with everyone who's involved with women's health, that you cannot ignore a remedy which is available to you 
it is the safest medical procedure today it's not even a procedure yeah. it's been taken out of medicine medical abortion today has made the whole process more democratic and more available in my country abortion is still the third highest cause of maternal mortality but deaths have come down from 12% to 8% in just the last 5 or 10 years and that is because medication abortion became available and i suspect a number of our women started taking care of themselves without depending upon healthcare providers so we know what to do it's yeah. just that i want to see it in black and white when we talk about targets and i want to see it in black and white when you talk about anemia and postpartum hemorrhage and say if we did safe abortions for every woman in the world we could easily cut this figure by a big amount right okay and now marlene um you've had three very interesting, well, many lives, but three I want to focus on. You've had a political life as a senator in Parliament. Um, you've had a life in an international health agency at WHO, leading HRP. And you've also had a life as an obstetrician on the front line. Um, why do people prefer to look the other way? And let's begin to talk about what we can do to redress that. Starting maybe with my life as a, an obstetrician, I think, since 85 till now, I have done about 18,000 deliveries, and my maternal mortality rate is 72. I mean, 72, so it's quite high. Half of those women who died while I was taking care of them are young girls who went for a backstreet abortion, a typical on a Friday night, and who were admitted in the hospital with this kind of complications on a Sunday afternoon, and very often too late. So I'm really. I still see the faces and I'm horrified by, by this. So as an obstetrician, I think I'm very, and as a woman, very much involved in that. As a politician, um, the, the way we changed the law in uh, 1990 in Belgium was as a medical uh, community of practice, engaging with women's groups, with youth and with parliamentarians. So it was thanks to that engagement that finally we managed to, to change the law. And I think that's what I would recommend everyone to... But it, it's becoming more and more difficult because we are now more than 20 years after ICPD and the pushback is mm -hmm. kind of stronger mm -hmm. in that in abortion than it was before. Mm -hmm. Then my, my life um, within WHO uh, I had the privilege to lead a great department, the uh, Reproductive Health and Research Department. And with, with this group, a lot of work has been done and is still going on on safe abortion. The group made the guidelines on safe abortion for different health categories, how to shift from you know, the task shifting, task sharing, even got an award for that. So it is very strongly in one department. But, but you don't see the Director General talking about abortion, but do you? If you look at the health topics, mm. right, you go to WHO website, you go to the health topics, you will not find abortion. Mm. Not with the A, because if you would write abortion, then it's the first health topic you would find. So you have to look for it, it's under the P, mm. preventing of unsafe abortion. So there, also in the kind of the global community in WHO and in others, it is very difficult to put abortion really uh, where it belongs. Did you ever try to get uh, Dr. Chan to put abortion in one of her major speeches? I think it would be... <laughs> no, but did you <laughs> yeah. ever try? Did you ever yeah, yeah, try? Tried. And when yeah. you tried, I mean, she gives a speech, like next Monday afternoon, she'll be giving the major speech in front of her member states. Did you ever try to get abortion into that speech? Yeah, we did. And what happened? Well, it's, you know, a lot of departments suggest DG put this and this and this. It never got there. Did she ever reply to your emails? No, 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 no. Did you ever have a direct discussion with her about abortion? About many aspects about abortion. But about abortion? Yes, yes, yes sure. she did. And what did and she say? Is, well, you know, she is always saying that WHO, and it's true, is a secretariat oh, of all the countries. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So then, It's a great course, excuse, though. You have, yeah. I think, what, what personally, what I, what I think that you need is first of all evidence, because yeah. WHO is always, and the, the global community, talking about evidence-based. So if you are logic and you talk about the evidence-based in reducing maternal mortality, prevention of abortion with family planning, and 
doing abortion, access to abortion should be number one or two, it should be very high on the agenda. And then, of course, there is diplomacy. It is true that you are dealing with all the, the secretariat of the countries in the world, and I have been very much involved in other issues such as gender-based violence, uh, contraceptive uh, access to um, emergency contraception. And I remember the long hour discussions with different uh, areas of the world. So it is true, but it is difficult. But yeah. still I think WHO should provide that leadership that is based on evidence. And there is enough evidence to say and to go for, we should talk about abortion. Let me ask. I would say not we should talk about abortion, we should act. Well, but let me put a. I mean, this is very easy to talk about acting and yeah, yeah. Uh, demanding rights and so on, but Pope Francis said very recently in an interview, which is um, available to everybody to see, he described abortion as a crime and absolute evil. That's the official view of one church that represents over a billion people on our planet. Um, how does one begin to address the idea that abortion is an evil um, a cr and a crime? I mean, this is a very, very, very direct um, statement that we, we, we have to confront. We can't just keep talking about rights and services. We have to confront that very direct view, which is expressed repeatedly at institutions like Human Rights Council, World Health Assembly, General Assembly. So. Yeah. No, sir. Uh, before I come to that, I'd just like to say one thing, that I'm a little concerned about treating abortion mainly as a public health issue. Okay. It's, it's important when you are working on abortion, maybe in some parts of the world, because you've got to be smart and practical, but this might be a self-defeating argument in parts of the world where it's no longer a public health issue. Abortion is not a public health issue. Abortion is a reproductive rights issue. Right. Abortion is an issue of choice. Or you will have a country like Chile telling you, we have completely banned abortions and we still have no maternal mortality due to abortion. But not for the Catholic Church. So how so now, as far as so the church as so far imagine as the, Pope Francis was sitting yeah, here. As far in the as the audience, church is concerned, say? what I'd like to tell the Pope is in my practice I have a lot of Catholic patients. <laughs> and a lot of them come to me for abortions. In fact, one of Every patient has a story, but one of my most touching stories is I had, a, I had this patient of mine who is a daughter of two very close friends, both of them are Catholics, both of them are gynecologists, and this daughter had to come behind her parents' back without telling her husband from another city in India to me for an abortion. Mm. And it broke my heart. She was doing the right thing, and millions and millions of women of all the possible religions of the world do the right thing and yet they are made to believe it's wrong. What bothers me is the woman will do it anyway and then she will spend her life regretting it. My solution is sometimes, well you have to, well, you have to use their words for our benefit. Uh, interestingly, I also read something the same Pope said. He said, uh, uh, said women seek abortion because they believe they may have no other option. I actually read this line somewhere that was said by Pope Francis. Well, he's saying what we say. Mm. Uh, anyway, I tell my patients because I got to make them feel better. So the first thing I tell each and every patient of mine, and this was something I'd said in one of the earlier Women Delivers, thanks to Gutmaka, the number has changed. I say, you know what? Anything 42 million women do each year cannot be wrong. Mm. And I'm going to go back and tell them anything 56 million women do each year. That woman goes back and we, can, we need to throw this number out. We need women to read this number. I also to make them feel better because that's my job as her healthcare provider. I need to have a going back feeling not just safe but also feeling good about herself. And I'm sorry, again I'm, I'm, I'm being a little out there. Well I tell them, do you know that there are certain sects of Christianity which don't have a problem with abortion? Mm -hmm. And they're surprised to know that. And I say, do you know that there's an organization called Catholics for Choice? of very good Catholics who don't have a problem with abortion. Yeah. And then I slip in something like, and I'm, I'm saying this here, it seems like Christ doesn't have a problem with abortion. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that woman goes yeah. back yeah. feeling not so bad about herself because she's been told every Sunday morning that what she's done is wrong. I tell Muslim women that, do you know, and Imam will help us hear better, I tell them that, do you know that in Islam, Abortion is okay till the soul comes into the body and different 
sects in Islam say it comes in at a different time. And then I say, do you know that the Republic of Iran actually legalized abortion for some reasons a few years ago? She goes back feeling good about herself, saying mm. that, you know what, I'm not all wrong. Mm. Women will do the, what they have to do. Mm. They'll feel miserable about it, they'll feel good about it, we have to make them feel good. Emma, you were nodding your head there as well. I was just thinking, what would I have told the Pope if he was sitting right there and um, if he had said what you wrote, what you, um, what you read earlier, uh, Richard. Uh, I would have probably told him if your daughter, well he doesn't have a daughter, <laughs> but if your daughter or sister was one of these women yeah. with these complications, with these disabilities, how would you have felt about it? Because this goes back to the story I shared about how do you feel about something when it affects you directly and how do you feel about it when you just talk about an idea or uh, um, a principle. Um, luckily, what he said does not have a major impact in my country because uh, it's a country with a large majority of Muslim population. And as Nazar said earlier, it, um, Muslim scholarship has definitely been more open to discuss this issue. But I have to share with you the fact that I have mixed feelings uh, talking about these issues because for years we have tried to involve people from different perspectives, from the legal perspective, the policy perspective, the religious perspectives. And in religion specifically, there is something called personal interpretation where there is no room for discussion. I mean, mm. you can have the interpretation that you want and I can have the interpretation that I want and this is the beauty of, of you know, this freedom um, and we'll never come to an agreement. So are we going to leave these women dying, mm. going through unsafe procedure, seeking improper care while we sink in our, you know, ethical and religious and political debates yeah. with no solution at the end. Well, let's just think about this solution. I, I was very interested in knowing what you said about um, this issue of should we be discussing abortion as a health issue or as a political issue. Um, research from the US Pew Research, um, half of Americans uh, believe that abortion's immoral. So they often frame, half of American people frame abortion as an issue of morality. The case might be made that if we could shift that to make it an issue of health, then you might be able to shift opinions. I mean, is there not a case to try and, if, if you focus on the personal stories, the health stories, which can be so moving and so powerful, then we could actually move the needle of world opinion on abortion? It, it, it might, be, it might be possible in some parts of the world. Mm. But say in a country like America, where again, uh, st data has shown that uh, one in three women will have an abortion at some point in her life. I mean, that itself tells you that mm. a majority of American women at some point will have to undergo an abortion. If you extrapolate it to the number of women in the world, uh, abortion, forget religion, forget background, forget everything, abortion is common. 56 million women a year, 10 year addition, again I said this in the last women deliver, if you take women who had an abortion last 10 years and bring them together to live in one country, third most populous country in the world after China and India. Mm. That's the kind of numbers we are talking about. We are not just talking about health, we are talking about a majority of humanity who needs this to be available mm. because they want it to be available not because they need it to be available. Mommy? I want to react because I fully agree that it's in the first place a rights, a women's rights issue, but it is also a health issue. Just the fact that so many women have morbidities, they die of it. So it would be kind of, I think we, we have to use the public health approach as well and saying it is, if we don't allow women to have access to safe abortion, then they have health issues. So per definition, it is a health issue, it is a rights issue, but it is also a political issue. Mm -hmm. In every election, you know, like US president and in all countries, abortion is on the table. It's a topic. In my country, our king abdicated when abortion was legalized because it was against his conscience and his 
religion and his philosophy. So it is, whether you like it or not, it is a health, a rights, a political issue, and a legal issue. And I think we should do everything we can to get it out of the law. It should not be criminalized. So I think we should have abortion is a decision to be made by women and with the medication that is available now, early in pregnancy, women can have access to medication. They even don't need medical interventions. For the ones who are further in pregnancy, there should be guidelines and it is a matter of the, the woman and her doctor how to do it and, and what should be done and depending on gestational age. So I, just, I think we should decriminalize mm. abortion mm. and get it out of the legal mm. I think it's. A, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's a health issue. But I also think that it's a control issue and a power issue. And um, I'm always surprised when I go to conferences when we talk about gestational diabetes or preeclampsia or infection. There's never a politician, never a faith-based a, a faith leader there to talk about these things. But when it comes to abortion, all of a sudden, we become interested in women's health, it's important, it's this and that. So uh, I also think that we need to be honest and define what are our priorities or what is our goal. Are we doing politics? We don't have the right to do politics when we play about women's lives and health. Are we trying to advance a political agenda? There are people dying because of this political agenda. If we're interested in women's health and rights, it should be the global thing. We should not just, you know, take a few things and then um, leave the rest. I want to pick up the issue that's been a big issue at this conference, and that's um, the special case of adolescents. Um, I think adolescent girls, young women, face particular challenges and particular difficulties and burdens. Can we talk about adolescence and, again, from your experience, what are the particular issues that we need to focus on when we're thinking about abortion among adolescents? Who'd like to? I think very often access to reproductive health services and they need consent. Like, um, in, I'm working now in Kenya, but also in other African countries, in South Africa, for example, a healthcare provider has to report to the authorities if there is a girl below 18 who is coming for an abortion because mm. some countries, Kenya for example, the law to, uh, to protect girls uh, and to prevent child marriage, there is no law that says you cannot have sex below 18. Mm. So that means, in theory, you cannot get access to family planning, to contraception, definitely not to abortion. So I think we have to, to review that. And where that do is, those young women go? Where, well, there are NGOs, there are organizations like Mary Stopes and others mm. who provide the services, but legally mm. you, you cannot. And in South Africa, the healthcare providers and in, in other countries as well, it's really a burden on them because they are legally obliged to report when there is a below 18 coming for an abortion. They don't do it. Mm. But I mean, it's, it's, one of, it's only one of the facts. But parental consent, uh, we talk about youth-friendly um, health services. Mm -hmm. I've seen many youth-friendly health services. There are a couple of paintings in different colors. Mm -hmm. But you never see youth there, because at the same clinic where the youth-friendly services, you have their aunties, their neighbors, their mothers, who are coming for maternal health, for family planning, so young people don't go there. And that's really, we have to rethink access to um, health services and to sexual and reproductive health services for young people. I think when we talk about adolescents, we can't, uh, you know, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all um, response. And they're not a homogeneous group. There's the married and unmarried, the rural and the urban. Um, two major patterns that I'd like to highlight. The first one is that among this group, there's a tendency to delay uh, seeking care and abortion services, which means that we very often are in the situation where we're talking second trimester um, termination of pregnancies. And uh, the second one is 
because of all the stigma around it, they're the perfect candidates to seek unsafe abortion services because of the money needed when they need to go to, private, to the private sector, because of the stigma when you're a young, unmarried girl in going to a public health structure and seeking the service, even when it's legal. And uh, the, that makes adolescents particularly vulnerable to uh, unsafe abortion and to the complications that mm. result from unsafe abortions. In India, yeah, there, there's no doubt that there are access issues for young people when it comes to reproductive health, and they are the worst when it comes to accessing safe abortions. So they have they have difficulty in accessing safe sites. Mm. They'll end up coming late and putting themselves at grave risk, and then land up with an unsafe provider. But uh, in I, I'll share with you an experience we've had in India, which is I think a big eye opener for all us activists in general. And that is that, well, in India we had uh, the age of consensual sex as 16. And we, when we wrote the round, last round of amendments, we wanted to reduce the age of consent for abortion to 16 from 18. Unfortunately, between that and the amendments moving ahead, our parliamentarians uh, in their wisdom, and they are, they are you know, it's, it's a very, Mm. old man dominated parliament in India, mm. they decided that the age of consensual sex in India should be 18. So all sex in India below the age of 18 has been criminalized. Right. That was bad. Now to make it worse, we had an act in 2012, a very well-meaning act called the Protection of Children Against Sexual Offences Act, which made any sex under the age of 18 come under the definition of rape with legal consequences for the perpetrator who might be a 19 year old boy mm. and worse still knowledge of this would have to be reported to the authorities meaning police and in many parts of the world the police aren't people you can really trust for sensitivity mm. and not only that if you didn't do that you could be imprisoned we had members of our federation who have done everything according to the abortion law including taking guardians consent who actually had police cases against them because they had failed to report it to the police. Now this is scary. Yeah. Lesson to activists is when you're working on an issue, don't work in silos. No. Please look laterally, please look beside. We are an excellent act to protect children, but what it actually did is it put young people at risk because now it is driving them away from safe sites which will report to the police to people who will not report it to the police and exploit them. Thank you. No, sir. In, in many parts of the world, we're seeing um, much of the kind of dis environment for discussion about abortion get tougher, get harder. Um, and actually, um, maybe some of the progress we've been making over recent decades is actually rolling backwards. Um, is that something you've seen in your experience, that actually um, things are getting tougher in terms of advancing the case for, as you, I think you put it, Beautifully, Iman, um, talking about abortion as a service, a right, um, and a choice. But do you see optimism in achieving that objective? Or I do in my country. I do, but I know that this is definitely not the global trend. And the reason is, for years and years, abortion was completely excluded from the global, from the from the national, you know, debates and and, and political discourses. It was a no go. Nobody was interested in that. Um, it only affects women, you know, it's fine. Um, and um, a few months ago, a commission uh, put together by the king was um, in charge of reviewing the law and uh, coming up with a law that responds, you know, better to the realities of Moroccan girls and women. Now, there's obviously a lot of issues around the work done by this um, commission. It's very political. Um, everybody's pulling the strings. But um, it, the positive thing about it is that in a Muslim, quite conservative society, nobody's afraid anymore mm. about talking the word abortion. And no, we're not talking preventing abortion or dealing with the consequences of unsafe abortion. We're talking about abortion as a service. Many women talk about it as a right mm. and as a mm. choice that mm. every woman should have. And we don't know what the final outcome is going to be. It's a bit of a race. But um, I think it, it's a great model for countries in the region with similar 
cultural and social patterns mm. to at least start the discussion on the issue. Mm. And then, you know, it, it started the same way. Uh, I remember when Simone Weil in France started the debate, she was accused mm. of the worst possible things ever, and today she's mm. seen as a hero. Yeah. So, um, yes, the world is definitely not a friendly place to talk about abortion, but this doesn't mean that we mm. should stop talking about it. Marlene, you're now living in Nairobi. Um, Give us a perspective from Africa. Do you feel optimism or do you, are you anxious that we're not making as much progress as we should be? It is, in Kenya it is a bit difficult. Um, it is actually allowed only when the life of the mother is in danger. Exceptions are made, but um, we have to see how the new constitution and the new government now is dealing with it. Um, Globally, I think there are some areas and countries where there is really progress, but also in Europe, we see that the number of um, health delivery points is kind of decreasing. It becomes more difficult also in Europe, and some women have to travel like two, three hundred kilometers mm -hmm. to find a clinic where an abortion will be done yeah. or reimbursement is at stake and so on. And more and more doctors are using the conscientious objection. Mm. So um, even in a country where abortion is available, an individual healthcare provider, a doctor, a nurse, always has the right to say, I don't want this. And there is more and more aggression towards the healthcare providers. So there are some who stop offering abortion services because they are afraid or because they work in difficult um, uh, conditions, but the word conscientious objection is kind of, it's grown. Yeah. And we see in a number of European countries that this is really jeopardizing and hampering access to a uh, safe abortion. So this is something to worry about. No, so I think you sit on one of the regional advisory committees for Southeast Asia, is that yes. right? I mean, for looking across Southeast Asia, uh, how does it, how's the know, picture? Uh, Though I'm personally an optimist, I must say that abortions are always vulnerable. They're always at risk. In my country, we thought we were doing very well. We did our first round of amendments. Great. We started working on a second round of amendments. And then we had to grapple with the issue of sex-selected abortions. Yeah. And authorities will always prioritize one issue over the others. And even if it means putting the majority of risk to prevent a minority, they will do it. Yeah. So there's always risk. Different countries in the region have done it differently and you've got amazing experiences, Nepal with its new law. Uh, interestingly, uh, Bangladesh where abortions are illegal have always been proud of their MR statistics, menstrual regulation statistics. They've made it work. So, so country, countries usually find a way when it comes to these things. But what I'm optimistic about, and this I must say in a very candid sort of a manner for our part of the world, sometimes there is a benefit in being developing. Because when women have the choice and the ability of doing something themselves, they will do it. Mm. So in our country where the abortion medication is available retail, and as is in many different parts of our subcontinent and our part of Southeast, uh, South Asia, women will access abortion at retail points. Had it been a developed country, you are too regulated for this to possibly happen. But mm. in developing countries, it is possible. It is possible to access it directly. It's possible to access it on the web. And it seems like it's a good thing because women are looking after themselves, saving themselves, and probably uh, you know, not having to go in for all the additional expense of healthcare and stuff. Mm. I'm not saying this is the best possible thing to happen, sure. but as right. I once told a health secretary, until you've got something better to offer, please don't come in their way. <laughs> now, in our last five minutes, I wanted to look forward. Uh, let's look forward beyond Women Deliver. Um, what should we be doing when we leave this meeting? What should this community be organizing? What should we be thinking of if we're going to get, um, whether it's the Director General of the new Director General of WHO to talk about abortion, a head of state to pick up abortion and make sure they lead with it in, in their country? What do we need to do next? 
Let's start off, Marlene, and then we'll go down the path. Well, I think um, what is really important that now this is on the plenary agenda of Women Deliver, mm -hmm. which was not the case mm -hmm. in the other Women Delivers. So I think I want to thank the organizers that now finally the A word is prominently present here and that we talk about it. So, but talking only is not enough. We have to act and to make sure that things are uh, changing. And I really hope that the multilaterals, that the UN agencies are not kind of going away from the R, that they put family planning and abortion very high on the agenda of women and children and that there is a kind of a global attitude within the UN. We are talking about age 4 plus, now it's age 6 plus, mm -hmm. but they all have the same song in relation to women's health, women's rights, with including family planning and abortion. That, is, that would be great if that could mm -hmm. uh, accelerate. And then I think, as I said in the beginning, we have to look for uh, champions, advocates, leaders yeah. in our own regions, in our own countries. And we have great examples. We have queens, princesses, uh, heads of states, you know, the champions who are talking about maternal, newborn, child health. I hope we can also engage them in family planning that would move the agenda forward. And not only them, but because they have the power to mobilize groups. I'm often going to, there is a forum of African first ladies uh, who are working towards uh, cancer. And they mm. say when the first lady talks, everyone walks. Yeah. Wow. Okay. okay. Let okay. them walk. Okay. Emma, <laughs> Let them do the thing. Looking forward, what do we need to do? Just one thing. This is going to be No, difficult. you can say more than one thing. Um, well, within the three minutes we have. Okay. Well, uh, I have so many things coming up to my mind right now, but um, the idea that I would really like all of us to leave um, this room with is that um, abortion is a need. It's a service that a lot of women need, um, and it's a service that saves women's lives. So let's remove all the stigma, all the discrimination, all the taboo around it. Even, you know, a lot of people working um, on abortion advocacy or abortion services are made feel, you know, bad about working on this evil issue. Um, we should not. It's saving lives, and we should always keep that in mind. And we have wonderful figures um, published by the Guttmacher Institute in case more research was needed to prove yeah. that, you know, it is there, it is a reality. Women are dying or living with lifelong morbidities, and we cannot, we don't have the right and the moral responsibility to forget about these women. Thank you. Nelson. The first is probably the most practical, and we have all to work together to decriminalize abortion for women worldwide. Mm -hmm. it's, women can't be punished for seeking an abortion, whether it be legal, illegal, or whatever. And that would help them in a big way. The second is we need to talk about abortion and talk about it very loudly. I, I, I like, I like I like to say, we, we need to start shouting about it from the rooftops. I try and engage the women I look after, even the ones who aren't coming to me for an abortion, and talk to them about abortion. When I go back, I'm going to tell them what Women Deliver was about. And thirdly, uh, there was an organization whom I, which I served on, and at one point they had come out with a catch line saying, abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. And I fought the rare. And I wanted them to say safe, legal, and common. Mm. When 56 million happen each year, abortions have to be very common. They should be easily available. They should be available everywhere to women whenever they, whenever they need them. And of course, then they modified it. But they, what should have always been done, make unsafe abortions rare. But <laughs> abortions should be common. Right. OK. Please give a big round of applause to our three discussants. We've run out of time. 
Uh, I'd like to thank the three of them for being so open and direct and honest in the way they've laid out their case. I'd also like to thank you for coming to this. And I would like to echo what, was, what Marlene said and give a big thank you to Jill Sheffield and Katia Iverson for making this a plenary session. And we look forward to Women Deliver next time where I hope we can report further progress. Thank you so much for coming.